Hey, what's up, friend? This is Alex, and today we're going to talk real quick about panning, mic positions, and reverb in orchestral libraries. So we're going to do a very quick game here. I'm going to play this 10-second snippet from my Brian Tyler Tour 2 mock-up. And what I want you to do is to listen carefully and tell if, it if you think it is panned or not. I'm going to play it in 3, 2, 1... <laughs> So it was actually shorter than 10 seconds, but did that feel as if it was panned and open to you or did it feel centric and closed? For me, it's the first thing, but the curious thing is that I didn't actually add any panning to any instrument in this track. All you're hearing is the natural pen inside libraries themselves. And this is one thing I discovered a few months ago. Uh, basically, when I wrote my parts of the Caribbean uh, track, I sent it to a friend to ask him for feedback. And this guy is way better at orchestral music than I will ever be myself. And he told me, there's something wrong in this track. Uh, did you pan it? I was like, yeah, of course I panned it. You know, I always pan my tracks. So he's like, no, 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 no. Remove all the panning from the orchestral instruments. And I asked him why and told me, well, professional libraries like Metropolis Arc, Cinematic Strings 2 and everything, they come pre-panned. So... Pretty much inside the library yourself. It's, it said something to me that, which went like this. I don't remember if it, it was exactly what he said, but basically inside the library itself, you know, on each and every note, you have the sound of an instrument which has been recorded by microphones in a way that was already pre -penned. So each instrument, when you play it inside the library, it's going to sound as if as it sounds in nature in a real orchestra because they place it in such a way to represent that sound. And you also have a bit of reverb inside the note because of the mic positions. Here I have the close position, uh, which is the loudest right now, and the three. But even with the close and three, you still have a bit of the tail, a bit of the reverb tail. So what happens when you pan your instruments is you are also panning the reverb inside the instrument itself. So it's not as if you're moving like a cello or a double bass to the right, if you're panning it to the right. You're actually moving the whole room in which it was recorded to the right. So if you do this for every single instrument in your track, say 20 instruments, it's as if you initially had this concise room, which was where all the instruments were stored, and now you split it in different ways. You have 20 rooms spread throughout the space. And that gives you a sound which is very, like, unclear, clut like cluttery and not very much defined. And it sounds weird. Now, if you're not trained, you're not, you're not trained about orchestral realism, realism and everything, you might not even realize. So I never realized myself because I wasn't as trained as my friend was. But then he, being a guy who works in very high you know, movies and everything, um, top-notch stuff, he told me, well, there's something wrong here. I was able to figure it out. So I don't use spending anymore after that. I tried to remove the panning from the track and sent it back to him. And he's like, this is much better. And as I analyzed the non pan track versus the pan track, I noticed that the panning actually made things much worse because of what I just explained to you. So try not to not use panning. Uh, I might have told you to use it in my previous tutorials, in which case I was wrong and I'm sorry. There are a few instruments, though, which I pan. Not all libraries come pre penned like Metropolis Arc. Some libraries, like the Contact Factory library, sound very dry and very alien, which they were not recorded in real rooms like this. So in that case, maybe I will pan them, you know? Or also percussive libraries. Like for percussion, I tend to pan stuff because you are a bit more free there. You're not trying to like, you know, represent a real orchestra. Usually a real orchestra has a very well-defined, you know, seating uh, organization, percussions, do not, I think. So for percussion, I still pen a little bit, but not too much. And for synthesizers, also I pen. Also, I wanted to talk about mic positions. On each professional library, usually you tend to get multi -mic, multiple mic positions. You tend to have a close mic position or a stage or surround. Here you have close, A, B, 3, and surround. And A, B, and 3, if you read the Metropolis Arc 1 manual, you'll find exactly what that means. But basically, the, the more you go to the right here, the more the sound widens. Now, 
when, you know, I, in the beginning of my career, or for the most part in my career, I didn't use the Mac positions. I just left them as they were. In most cases, that was never a problem. But for how Metropolis Arc 1 is set up, uh, the mic positions, I don't remember exactly how they are naturally in Metropolis Arc 1. Uh, I think it was something like A, B, and 3. And the fact is that depending on how you set up your mic positions, you tend to have a different sound. So if you basically, if you want a more clear, uh, more aggressive, and better defined sound, it's a good idea to set the mic positions tending more to close. So in this case, I have my close mic to plus 6 dB. And I had my three mic to minus six before. This is the balance I found in Metropolis Arc, which I like. So I tweaked it a little bit to have a nice, you know, bite, but also a bit of like reverb left. Basically, if you enable the surround, uh, for example, uh, here we're using the bass. So this is surround only. You notice we have a, you know, it sounds way bigger. It's immense, actually, compared to this. It's still the same sound, but since we changed the mic position, it changes the way it sounds. We have less reverb in the recording, so it sounds more defined, but less broad. So when you set your mic positions, just know that the more broad you go, uh, the more your sound is going to sound huge and atmospheric. So it makes sense maybe to set, you know, surround or stage mic positions for sustain elements. You want to be in the back. But for stuff like uh, spiccatos or stuff that you want to be more defined and more aggressive and have more bite, try to use closer mic positions. What I do is I tend to use closer mic positions on anything, and then I just use my reverb setting to make stuff sound a bit more far, a bit more close. And also, um, this is what I use for my reverb. Basically, with this thing I set up, the more, the closest this dot gets here, the less reverb I have, so the more close stuff sounds. Now, the, the thing I did wrong with the reverb, which is another thing that my friends made me notice, and by the way, like, this is the reason why I really predicate having composer friends, is that you can send tracks for feedback to people who maybe will give you help because they know more than you, and they, you know, lead you to realize these things that on your own you cannot realize. Now... I understand having composer friends or making friends with composers, it's very tough. So to solve that issue, I created a Discord server for composers of this community on this YouTube channel where anyone can come and talk and ask for feedback and enjoy conversations between composers. And I'm going to leave a link to that Discord down below in the description of this video. But with that aside, my composer friends back in the day told me, Alex, there is something wrong with your music. It sounds kind of like cluttery mix, dirty mix for some reason. And I didn't understand. I put so much work in my arrangements and they told me there's something wrong. Maybe you're using too much reverb. And I went and looked into it. The, the error I did with reverb myself was the fact that I set my reverb depth super high. So when I opened Valhalla Room for the first time, I had no idea what these things meant. And I think I read the manual, but then I forgot to actually apply what I read. Basically, my reverb uh, back in the day... Since I used the, you know, the stage mics in Metropolis Arc, I had a lot of reverb internally in my sounds already. But then on Valhalla Room, I would also have the depth parameter be so freaking high. And the depth parameter pretty much determines how far something sounds in the reverb, like how much more reverb you get. So if I set the depth to 100% and I just play the reverb, this is what it sounds like. That's the wet signal only. If I set the depth to 18%, compared to. So when I set, pretty much, it's not that much noticeable, but when I set it to 100%, the reverb is way more thick and fades away with way much more, like way much more slowly. Also the decay time is also determining how slow the river actually goes to zero. So if I set the decay time to, I don't know, 18 seconds. You see it like fades away very slowly. And this is a good thing if you want to create incredible pads with loads of like, that feel as if they're infinitely huge, then it's good to send them to a reverb unit that has lots of depth and lots of decay time, because then you create that awesome, huge, droning tail. But for the orchestra, 
you want to have, you know, a little depth and little decay. So those are things I learned, which I wanted to make a video about very fast. So in short, the summary of this tutorial is that you can make your tracks sound way more clear, even without mixing them way more defined and amazing by first not using panning if you're using libraries which are professional and pre-panned which is most orchestral libraries nowadays two use mic positions at least set your mic positions to close to avoid having lots of reverb and three use reverb with you know fast decay and a little amount of depth that is going to give you the most clear signal that you can get without having to fight for it if you neglect these things and you get a dirty sound, a dirty river and everything, it's going to be very difficult to fix it in post. So try to not create these issues in the first place by using these three things in the way I just explained it today. And that is all for this video. I hope it was helpful. And if you're new here, feel free to subscribe to this channel and check out the rest of the tutorials. If you're not new, please leave a like, a thumbs up on this video if possible, because that's the best of ways in which you guys can help me spread this message and help as many people as possible. And also feel free to join us on Discord for amazing conversations and more. That's all for this video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.